see you, um, Teresa. Always optimistic, always very kind and with a big smile. I think uh, that's just what we need in these trying times. So thank you. Okay, so I will jump right in. Um, can you see my slides? I hope you can. I started sharing them. And I will um, tell you a little bit about um, Old English conjunct clauses. What I want to do in this, in this talk is to demonstrate that there exist interaction effects between syntactic changes, that they can be predicted, that they can be measured, and that they are real. I also want to illustrate with this study how we can bring together corpus linguistics and formal syntax. Those two areas don't always harmonize very well. They don't always see eye to eye, but I think we can bring them together in a fruitful way. And my specific empirical phenomenon that I want to discuss is Old English conjunct clauses. I will build a model for those and then defend it. So let me say a few words about the corpus linguistics part. Uh, the databases that I use. The data that I will use today comes from a syntactically passed corpus known as the WICO, that's the York Corpus of Old English. And I will also use the earliest texts of Middle English from the pen past corpus of Middle English too, as well as my very own past corpus of Middle English poetry, the PCMEP. Um, if you want to find out more about this particular corpus, you can go to www.pcmep.net and then you can find all the information about the different texts that are included and how they're annotated. So shameless plug, maybe you want to work with these sorts of texts yourself, then you could go, go to this homepage here, pcmep.net and find out more. What's special about all of these texts is that I assign to them a, a specific date of composition. So every text is associated with a year. That's illustrated here for the early Middle English texts. Um, they come from, as I said, my own corpus and the PPCME too. And every text that you can see here has one assigned year to it. Of course, these years can only be approximate. There's a lot of noise in the Middle English data, a lot of uncertainties, but I read a lot of the relevant background literature and tried to come up with a reasonable guess. And these, this sort of dating, I think, is superior to binning into periods, as we will see later. Okay, so that's the corpus data. Those are the goals. Let's jump right into it. And I will tell you a bit about the special status of Old English conjunct clauses. Conjunct clauses are basically just main clauses, declarative main clauses, but they are introduced by a conjunction like and, or, but, or nor. Conjunct clauses will be abbreviated CC, so CC and on these slides stand for conjunct clauses, and um, main clauses will be abbreviated MC. The first distributional oddity about CCs is that they show a lot less topicalization than MCs. So if we have a sentence such as M, like 1A, where there is a DP in initial position before a subject, such as the Southern star, uh, we did not ever see. We did not ever see the Southern star with the Southern star fronted to initial position, then this is a topicalization configuration. If I compare this to CCs, that is to say clauses that have an initial conjunction, such as and here shown in red, I can also get structures like this. So for instance, and this song we frequently sang. So the song is the object of sing, but it comes in initial position. So that's what we call topicalization, a topic position. And then we can count the occurrences, the frequency of these different patterns. We will find that main clauses with topicalization are relatively common. They exist quite a lot of sentences like this in Old English, whereas with initial conjunctions, they're quite rare. Okay, so that's the first distributional difference. The second difference is much more widely known, and that is that conjunct clauses are much more likely to show the verb in finite, in final position. They are verb final sentences much more frequently than ordinary main clauses. It's mainly because of this scholar, Bruce Mitchell, uh, that this fact has become widely known. So now it has become more or less a standard division to look at MCs, CCs, and subordinate clauses separately and acknowledge CCs as a special kind of clause type in Old English because of these facts. 
So in 2A, we have a normal subject verb sentence in a main clause. The angel encouraged them. Okay, so here's the subject, the angel, here's the finite verb, verb encouraged. But if we have a conjunction in initial position, then what we find is that very frequently, the verb will actually come at the end. So here we have end, and then the subject, that people, and then a lot of material in between, now yet, that sign of Joseph's law, and then here's the verb, after follows, comes at the very end. And that's a common configuration in CCs where you have this initial conjunction. Those are the distribution effects, topicalization less common, verb final patterns more common. And I propose to account for this as follows. I would assume that our old English conjunctions have actually a double class membership. They can be conjunctions, ordinary conjunctions, which I abbreviate here conj, exactly as in modern English, but uh, that's my proposal. They can also be complementizers of category C. So that's shown here on the left side. The conjunction, I will also call logical connectors. And here you can fill in whatever your preferred theory of ordinary modern coordination should be. Okay, so I say and is my form and it is of category conj for conjunction. And it can then be used, in, for instance, in context-free phrase structure rules such as a CP. And I use CP for matrix clauses, for main clauses. CP can rewrite to CP a conjunction and a CP that can then generate structures like those shown here with um, you know, a CP coordinated with another CP and then the rest of the clause, including potentially a topic and the IP for the rest of the clause. Now, if you don't like this ternary structure, no problem at all. You can substitute here whatever you want. So for instance, you could have a conch and then a conch bar and then a conch P with the individual conjuncts as specifiers and complements of the conjunction. That's absolutely fine. So uh, you can substitute here whatever your theory should be. The point is, this is basically the modern English, the innovative form of our conjunctions like and. What's special is in old English, I claim, they can also be complementizers, and I will call those C-head conjunctions. So here's my form and, and it is of category C. It can therefore be used under the C position in a phrase structure rule such as C bar rewrites to C and IP. This will generate structures like shown in 4C, where end occurs under the complementizer position. And then our IP here can contain the rest of the clause like subject and verb. And you can already see here that there is no topic in initial position with these sorts of structures. Now I will come back to how this model exactly explains the word order distributions in conjunct clauses. For now, I just want to justify this idea a bit. You might say, this is crazy. What an absurd idea. How can conjunctions possibly be complementizers? So I have a couple of arguments. They're not demonstrations. They're not evidence. They just are attempts to make this story more plausible. And for reasons of time, I will only talk about one, and that is the etymology of these structures. So let me say a little bit about the etymology of the word end. And actually comes from a proto-Indo-European derivative of a noun like forehead or front. It is the singular locative. So this is this, the second laryngeal, and then NT. And this is the ancestor of reflexes, such as the preposition ante in Latin, which means in front of, you know, as in um, Hannibal ante portas. Hannibal is in front of the gates, as well as the ancient Greek word anti, anti so the origin for the modern English suffix anti as in antibiotics, and that means opposing. So I think that's interesting right away. The, the, the word end is actually related to words like ante or anti. Now what happens in Proto-Germanic is that, you know, the second laryngeal becomes an a, so anti and then anthi by Grimm's law and anthi by Werner's law. And that gives us directly Gothic ant, which is also a preposition, but usually a locative preposition like into or through. It also gives us a number of adversative prefixes. For instance, the prefix ent in German yeah, uh, means something also uh, opposing, ent gegen or something like this. Uh, it, it's also a part in the etymology of the word answer in English. Uh, the swear part here is literally related to swear, and the un means in reverse or in reply or opposing. So I say something, you say something, and then I say something 
in, in reply, opposing to you. So literally something like against swear. What happens then is that this preposition develops into an adverb. I think that's pretty easy to explain. After all, adverbs are basically just intransitive prepositions. And that's in Northwest Germanic, where it can have a number of different meanings, like contrastive meanings, nevertheless, still, but also temporal meanings, like then or afterwards. So for instance, in Old Norse, we have n, which means something like still or yet. And in the West Germanic languages, it usually has some sort of a temporal sense, and then. So from this, we can, I think, come up with a story that the structure X then Y could be reanalyzed into a conjunction like X and Y. And what happens is that this is a grammaticalization process. In the formal uh, literature on grammaticalization, there's a frequent idea that grammaticalization is basically a spec to head reanalysis. Uh, that has been popularized, for instance, at your fine institution by uh, Roberts and Rousseau, but also by other people, where an element in the specifier of a CP essentially becomes the head of the CP, and this spec to head reanalysis that corresponds to a grammaticalization path. And so I claim this is basically the state that we find in anglo frisian and then later on to some degree still in Old English. So again, that's sort of a story, that's how I rationalize the existence of a word like and as a complementizer in that language stage. Now you may not believe this at this stage, you don't have to believe it, but uh, you should um, understand that what I'm claiming is uh, that Old English has variation between and as a conjunction as a complementizer, and it is in the process of replacing these C hat conjunctions with logical connectors. So in the earlier stages of Old English, if you had a uh, structure like P and Q, it would actually be passed as two independent sentences P, and then also an independent matrix clause and Q with end under the C position, and that gets reanalyzed into one integral phrase P and Q with two conjuncts forming a larger clause. So that is basically my claim, that is my model. Uh, and I hope so far most people will understand this, um, but um, I'd, I'd be quite happy if most people could follow me. So if there are any questions at this point about what I'm proposing here, be quite happy uh, if you could just ask your question now so that I'm not losing anybody early on in my talk. So uh, I'll just wait 10 seconds here in case somebody wants to ask a question. I hope that makes sense so far. Okay, oh, uh, okay. then uh, I will now move on to the question of how this model explains the special word order distributions in CCs. Let's start with topicalization. Topicalization is modeled as fronting of an XP to the specifier of CP. So here's my XP. Uh, it starts out somewhere inside of the IP, and then I front it to a special position, the specifier of CP, the initial position that is marked for particular information structural interpretations. This fronting is quite common in Old English, and it has mainly been studied for DPs, but also for PPs, although in principle other categories can front as well. And it is information structurally driven, as I will illustrate now. So here are a couple of examples of topicalization. Ethelhere, the brother of Anna, and then we get Thorne, that's a accusative demonstrative, that one, him, he, so it sort of stresses this uh, item, that one, uh, people killed with all his troops. So this is your prototypical topic usage. This is old, it picks up a previous antecedent and links to it. So that's your prototypical topic usage that has been studied amongst others, for instance, by Betelou Loos and her colleagues, where it goes under the keyword of anchoring. So in a sense, these structures are used to anchor and structure discourse, and this can be used to create narrative cohesion. But we also find contrastive topics as in 10b. So we have to the sinful, he promised God's goodness, but to the good, uh, he told that they should stay good. So here's a clear contrast between the bad ones, the sinful, and, you know, the virtuous ones, the good ones. And so this contrastive usage also occurs quite frequently. Finally, there are all kinds of sentences that don't really fall into any of these categories. They're more used for general saliency to make the text more interesting, uh, as in 10c. 
in boiling oil, he ordered him bathe. So in boiling oil, he ordered that one should bathe him clearly very dramatic. So this is sort of, you know, the poetic function of Jakobson, special emphasis, special narrative use of topicalizations. I also want to very briefly say something about subject topicalization. That's just a side note, but there was a debate maybe 15 years ago, whether or not subjects could also occur in the specifier of CP. And my opinion is that they can. And I just want to present a couple of um, arguments as to why that is. So first of all, um, if a verb is negative, it has a very high chance to occur under C in a high position. If the verb is subjunctive, it also has a high chance to occur in that position. But if it is both negative and subjunctive, there's a better than 95% chance that it would occur in front of subjects in other um, contexts, so in front of the IP. And so if a subject occurs in front of such verbs, negative subjunctive verbs, I think it should definitely be high, that is to say in the specifier of CP. So here we have repsas, that means a reply in a church service, and then not should be sung, not uh, subjunctive, with a hallelujah. A response should not be sung with a hallelujah. Since this is negative subjunctive, I think this um, subject here needs to be in the specifier of CP. They also scrambled pronouns, as in 12. Here we have me, that's a pronoun, and it actually goes with this preposition to, so that means to me, but it occurs in front of the verb, so in a scrambled position. And um, in my opinion, this indicates the IP boundary, so we know that this is an IP here. Now, if a subject occurs in front of it, like my God, it can't really be inside of the IP, so once again, specifier of CP would be a plausible position for it. And then finally, I can also find some examples of long distance extraction. Now, if this was a living language, it would be a bit trivial. There wouldn't be anything special about it, but in a dead language like old English, I think it's kind of really cool. And um, we, are, we are lucky that examples like this uh, have survived and are attested. But here we have um, a DP, uh, this rule, and it is actually the subject of uh, be read in company. Uh, so this is a subject here, and it is then embedded under a predicate like I want and moved to the front. So this is an example of long distance extraction of a subject. And usually if a process is available at a distance, it is also available locally. So if you have a long distance extraction of subjects, it stands to reason that there could also be local extraction of subjects to that position. Okay, but that's just a side note. I just thought it's interesting. So I wanted to mention it. Um, what I will do is focus on objects, object topicalization. And what happens in this context is the following. If there is just an ordinary main clause, your topic can move to the specifier of C position, no problem. But if there is a conjunction that is under C intervening, then you cannot take this XP and move it into CP. As a consequence, CCs will have fewer um, topic topicalization structures but they're not completely absent. They, they don't block all topicalization structures because conjunctions can also be modern logical connectors and be of category conch. Where this is the case, they can just take a CP and then take this uh, topic within one of their conjuncts. So it reduces the number of topicalization structures, but it doesn't completely rule them out. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. That's sort of important. <laughs> so I think once again, I just stop here for 10 seconds. I open the chat in case somebody wants to ask something or make or ask a clarification question, but I hope that makes sense. Uh, so that should, that's sort of important. And once again, I hope most people will be able to follow my argument. Um, okay, so then we can measure this. I can look for structures such as the following. I look for an initial object such as, you know, um, long tails and then a pronominal subject as the indication of IP. Uh, we may make long tails we could make. That's a topicalization structure in a MC. And then I look for the same structures, but where there is an initial conjunction, for instance, and the height of horses they used with the height of horses in initial position in front of the subject pronoun. And we compare those to cases with a direct object after the pronominal subject. So here's our pronominal subject, he built, and then here is a object, a great church. That's a structure with an object, but not topicalized in an MC. And in D, we have the same structure, but with an initial conjunction, and he, and then he worked, and here's our object, many wonders. 
So we simply count all of these examples in our corpora, and then this is the result. This is what we find. Um, in MCs, 31% of all objects are topicalized if you measure it with subject pronouns like this, whereas in conjunct clauses, only 16% are topicalized. Uh, this fact, as I said, is actually not so widely known, but here you see the empirical evidence for this claim, and I hope you understand now how my model would explain it. Uh, let's now move on to verb position, which is a bit more difficult. Um, so for verbs, uh, what you need to understand is that your IP can be initial or final. That's shown here in the tree 16a and 16b. Uh, the I bar can dominate a verb phrase in initial position and an I in final position, but it can also have first the finite verb and then the verb phrase. So 16a looks a lot like German and 16b looks a lot more like modern English. And what happens in our period old and middle English is that the parameter for this IP is reset so that it changes from a final to initial position and we see variation in old English. That's shown here in 1718. So in 17, you have when you most wealth had, here's the object, most wealth, and here's the verb had, so that's verb final. And in B, we have because we have heavenly wealth, here's the object, heavenly wealth, and here's our verb. So this is first the verb, then the object. Okay. What's important though, is that verbs can also occur in a high position. So we can take a verb and put it under C into initial position. Now in a language like German, that's a more or less generalized process. It happens everywhere, creating verb second structures. In Old English, it's a much more restricted process that happens only in special environments. It happens in questions such as 19, came he um, you know, with his clothes on, first the verb, then the subject or uh, whence came you. So these interrogatives are sometimes seen as the core of uh, verb fronting, uh, of verb second in, in, in Germanic and it survives or is robust in Old English. It is also categorical with operator adverbs like tha and thonne meaning then. So we find then came we to the city, then and then the verb came in front of the subject we. Or thonne fins du theron in a gulden wedge, then find you, uh, a golden coin, first thonne, then the verb, then the subject, and there are almost no examples like then you find or then we come. That doesn't really exist in Old English. So this is a more or less categorical uh, verb inversion uh, context. With negation, you will find that there can be high verbs, as in 21a, not saw he, that's the subject, not saw he Christ, but they can also stay low, as in 21b, he not saw him. So here we have variation. Sometimes the verb is high when it's negation. Sometimes it stays in the IP. Uh, here's another example, not know they what they do, with not know negated with this um, fused clitic in front of the subject. But we also find uh, you don't know when the time is with don't know after the subject. Okay, so variation with negation. And then there's also variation in this complicated imperative hortative system. So for instance, in 23a, we have nime, that's a subjunctive, uh, this cloth. So this means something like, may he take his cloth, let him take his cloth, he should take his cloth, um, which can also stay in the IP. So for instance, he nime linen regel, he should take a linen cloth. Okay, so then of course this whole system disappears, the subjunctive marking disappears, imperative marking disappears, so this whole system collapses. But in Old English, there's variation when you have um, imperatives or these subjunctives. Okay, so now let's see how we can explain the distributional difference uh, between CCs and MCs with respect to verb placement. So what happens is, in main clauses, I can take the verb and put it directly under C, under I, right? Uh, but in conjunct clauses, this position will be blocked by a conjunction like and, and so it can't occur under C. Instead, it will remain in the IP. So it will, there will be a co complementary distribution between a high verb under C and verbs remaining in the IP. And only as an indirect consequence of this, will verbs also be more commonly final, 
Okay, so there is not, it's not actually true that verbs are inherently more final in CCs. It's a side effect, an epiphenomenon of the fact that the verb is not as frequently under C. But again, this is not categorical because we can also have modern conjunction-like conjunctions, and then those uh, will allow, as you can see in 25D, the verb under C as well. Okay, so <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Um, when we look for structures with high verb placement, we should find that there is a lower rate of high verbs. So the verb should occur less frequently under C and a rate of higher verbs in the IP, both final and medial. And so only as an indirect consequence of a higher proportion of verbs in the IP, also a higher proportion of verb final structures. I don't know. I, for me, this is sort of obvious, but I imagine if you hear this for the first time, it can be a bit confusing. So once again, I'll just stop here for a few seconds. And if you have any questions or you want me to clarify this again, type something into the chat or raise your voice. I hope that sort of makes sense. There's a complementary distribution, very much as in the classical Den Besten analysis of West Germanic, complementary distribution between overt complementizers and late verbs, except that here it doesn't happen with a complementizer, but with a conjunction under C. Okay, so uh, we can count this, and I will briefly show you how. We count all examples of V2C structures, as in 26A, then repays he with the verb before the subject, and we do the same in conjunct clauses, and then appeared he, same structure, but with an initial conjunction. Then we look for potentially I initial verb medial sentences. Those are sentences with the structure subject verb. For instance, they received a reward. And once again, we code separately for conjunct clauses and they received the Holy Ghost. And finally, I looked for necessarily I final structures. Essentially, those are sentences that first have a subject, then a lot of intervening material, and then at the end of the verb. Now you can argue about how best to measure this. What should the intervening element X be? Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but 28 illustrates. So we have first the subject, he, then a lot of stuff, then therefore Lord's will, and then the verb sought. And again, we code this separately for whether or not there's a conjunction as in 28B, end he earlier the warfare sought. So we count all of these sentences up and then this is what we find. So this is an important table uh, that summarizes um, the verb uh, placement differences. Let's first look at the final column, which shows you verb final patterns in the different clause types, main clauses, MCs, conjunct clauses, CCs, and also subordinate clauses, which I include here, uh, for reasons of comparison, SCs. And you can see that 4.2% of all main clauses are final, but about 15.5% of all conjunct clauses are final. This is the well-known fact. Uh, so CCs are more likely to be final. Um, what I think is important here is to quantify this effect correctly. So sometimes in the literature, you find relatively unqualified statements to the effect that CCs tend to be final or they're more commonly final. But here we can actually quantify this. And I would propose using the odds ratio for situations like this. So the odds of finding a verb final sentence in CC are about 4.2 times higher than those odds in main clauses. That's a fairly substantial effect. And it's sort of a good quantification of how strong that effect actually is so that we don't get misleading statements. But what's new, what hasn't really been pointed out enough is that conjunct clauses are also much less common with high verb placement, 48% of all main clauses have a high verb in front of the subject, but only a quarter, only about 23% of all conjunct clauses have the verb in that position. And both verb medial and verb final structures are more common. So 50% versus 60% and here 4% versus 15%. And so that corresponds very much to my expectation. And so that means conjunct clauses are not inherently more verb final than main clauses. The verb appears in final position simply as a result of a reduced ratio of higher verbs. Okay, so we can do a lot with this table. There's a lot of meat on this particular bone. And one thing that we can do immediately is to divide out the CCs into those clauses that are logical connectors because there's an intervening element. So first the conjunction, then X, then the subject versus those that can potentially be passed as a C head. And those are the sentences with the conjunction immediately before the subject. 
So I hope you can see this. If there's an intervening element between the conjunction and the subject, then you cannot put it under C because the, the, the marker here of the IP is too far away from the conjunction. But if the conjunction and the subject are right next to each other, then it could plausibly be analyzed as a complementizer. So here are two um, illustrations and then an intervening element in that service, then the subject, he ended his life in that and in that service, he ended his life. And you think it through, you cannot pass this sentence with the word end in complementizer position, right? It can only be a logical connector. But in 30, we have end, he thus ended the Old Testament. Here we have end right next to the IP indicated by the subject pronoun he. And here it is possible that this end should be in a complementizer position. Okay, so here is the table that I just showed you. But what I'm going to do now is separate out these CCs into the two kinds, um, potential C heads versus logical connectors. And this is what we find. <clears throat> so if there is a logical connector, they're basically exactly like main clauses. So if there is an intervening element between the conjunction and the subject, there isn't much of a difference in terms of verb final headedness, 4.2% in main clauses and 5.8% in conjunct clauses with logical connectors. It is really only these potential C head conjunctions that create this effect, which becomes of course stronger when I separate out these different clause types. So that's exactly like what I expect. Only when your conjunction can be a potential C head will you actually see the effect of differential verb placement. So I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's kind of a nice result, quite happy with this. And it goes very much in the direction of my model, I would, I would say. Okay, so now I get to the actual core, the actual meat of uh, this talk. This is the most difficult section. I hope you can follow my idea. So try to pay attention for the last few minutes. There is interaction between the syntactic changes and the C head conjunctions that are happening in Old English. So there are two well-established changes in early English, and I basically touched on those already. The first is a decline in topicalization. So topicalization with a XP in front of a subject actually becomes less common uh, during the early English period. And the second change, of course, is the loss of I-final headedness. So verb final structures become verb medial structures. And now there's a new change that I'm proposing, uh, namely the disappearance of C-head conjunctions. And there's interactions, there are interactions between these changes that we can measure, that we can predict. And so uh, this is quite important. That's the core of my talk. First of all, the decline in topicalization. Here I take a graph uh, from Speyer 2010, who has worked on this, and he finds that topicalization declines from about 15 to 5% in the old and early, um, early mod middle English periods. Okay, so that's a decline in topicalization. Over time, fronting things in initial position become less common. Here's a famous graph of the loss of verb final structure. So on uh, the x-axis, you find um, the date of composition of a text, and the y-axis shows you the frequency of I initial structures, so that's to say verb medial structures. And over time, verb medial structures go up. That means verb final structures go down. This is an extremely well-studied change. Um, it goes back at least to Smith 1893. And sometimes I say that this is possibly the best studied change in all of Old English or early, early English. Okay, and then of course, my change that I'm proposing, I just repeat this here, is the loss of C head conjunctions. So over time, the special elements like end that can be inserted under C die out and instead they have to be logical connectors. Now, let's see how these changes interact. It's a bit difficult, but I think it's, I think it's straightforward. I think it's logical. If this is true, then this should follow in that way. So how do C heads influence topicalization? Let's think this through. This process of fronting an XP and in, to initial position, that dies out, that becomes less common. Okay, so what's indicated here with this arrow, that's a declining process. Over time, topicalization goes down. But also these C head conjunctions die out, right? That's the, the third change which means the loss of seed conjunction should compensate to some degree for the decline in topicalization. Because as I lose these seed conjunctions, I open up the specifier of CP for topicalization. So yes, topicalization dies out, but it should die out less quickly in 
conjunct clauses because those have another process going on that allows more topicalization. It countervenes the loss of topicalization process. Okay, so if you measure object topicalization, again, as I did before, object pronoun uh, subject versus pronoun subject object, you should find that there's a decline in topicalization and this decline should be faster in main clauses than in conjunct clauses. Okay, so again, I just wait for one second. I really want most people to understand this. So if you want me to repeat this or if this logic doesn't make sense, just tell me now. <laughs> okay, so I expect a faster decline of topicalization in MCs than in CCs. So here's our table, that's table two again. What we do now is simply code every example in this text for a year of composition for this text and regress the loss of topicalization over time. And here's the result. This is what my results look like. On the x-axis here, you have time. So it goes from about 900 to 1200 over a 300 year period. And on the y-axis, you find the proportion of object topicalization. Every dot is a text and the size of the dot is proportional to the number of examples this text contains. Now the green line is main clauses and you can see a steady decline here. Topicalization goes down. The red line is conjunct clauses, and the decline here happens much, much more slowly. In fact, so much more slowly that there is a flat or even a slight increase in topicalization. So the loss of C head conjunctions compensates for the loss of topicalization to such a great degree that there is actually a slight increase. And um, by about 1200, there is no longer a measurable clause type difference with respect with, to topicalization between CCs and MCs. So I think this is really cool. That goes exactly in the direction that I would expect. Uh, the interaction effect between clause type and time goes exactly in the direction of my prediction. Okay, so then I move on to the second point, and that is the interaction between C at conjunctions and verb type. So that's the most difficult thing. Stay with me. Hopefully you can all understand this. So let's see. Um, so here this process indicates that verbs slowly become initial, right? So there's a change from I final to I initial headedness. Now verbs can also move to the C position. Okay, so that's indicated with these arrows here. But the C position will be opened up more and more frequently in conjunct clauses as these um, C head conjunctions disappear. So that means that verb final patterns will appear disappear. They will disappear in conjunct clauses, not only because verb final patterns disappear as such, but also because the verb can now move to C more frequently as this position gets opened up for verb final structures. So that's an additional uh, factor that reduces what seems to be verb final patterns or more generally verbs in IP in general. So we should see a faster decline of verb final patterns in CCs. All right, so I repeat this. When we measure the proportions of I final structures in a corpus and regress it against clause type and time, we should see that all clause types, main clauses, subordinate clauses, should lose uh, I final structures at the same rate, except for those clauses that may involve a C head conjunction. Those should lose verb final structures faster than others. Okay, so I really want people to understand this. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of clear in my head but I don't know if it's clear in your head. So if you're courageous and there's something unclear about it, you want to ask, do it now. I really hope this makes sense. So the, the prediction is uh, verb final structures should be lost more quickly in clauses with C head conjunctions. So here's our table again, table four that I showed you earlier that lists the different verb order patterns by clause type. We have four clause types, MCs, CCs with logical connectors, CCs with potential C at conjunctions and SCs. So we put for every example, uh, text and a year and a number of other factors in, type it all into a statistics program. The model actually takes quite a long time to run because there are tens of thousands of examples and the model is a bit complicated. It runs, it runs, it runs, and runs, and then it spits out this model. And I remember I actually, when I first ran this model, it was quite late. Um, and uh, I don't know, I came back and I saw this and I just, I couldn't believe it. It was just absolutely insane. 
I still don't really believe it. It's, it's too good to be true, but we, what we need to look at are these interaction variables here. So this is interpreted in the following way. If you compare main clauses to conjunct clauses that are logical connector, there is no significant difference in the rate of change. So verb final structures in MCs and CCs are lost at the same rate. If you look at uh, the difference between main clauses and subordinate clauses, again, not a difference. Uh, the rate of change is not significantly different between main clauses and subordinate clauses, not significant at all. But you look at the difference between main clauses and complement clauses that can involve a C at conjunction, and the change speeds up a lot. So um, verb final structures are lost at a rate of 0.06 log odds per year, and this change speeds up uh, by 200% almost, so by 0 0.0012, uh, in addition to this loss in these clauses that involve a logical, uh, sorry, a C head conjunction. This uh, graph here illustrates this. So in green here at the bottom, we have main clauses, and in light green CCs with logical connectors, they're basically on top of each other. They're basically exactly like the same kind of main clauses. In blue, we have subordinate clauses, and the line, the green line and the blue line have the same slope. They change more or less at the same rate. The difference in the slope between the blue lines and the green lines is not significant. But the red line is significantly faster than the blue line or the green line. That's exactly what you would expect uh, if my model is correct. And it's almost amazing to me. You, you sort of have an expectation of how the world should behave. You go out and you test and then it actually does behave like you expect. It's a, it's a fantastic feeling. I still think uh, this is basically uh, the coolest empirical finding uh, I've ever had in my um, academic career. So I'm, I think it's quite cool. I'm quite proud of it. And yeah, so that's, that's the core finding here. It's, I think it's cool, a bit difficult to explain. Hopefully you could sort of understand my logic. Okay, so just a few minutes to summarize. Um, I hope I could show that syntactic changes can interact with one another in such a way that we can measure them, that we can observe them, that we can um, predict them in corpus data. And in that way, I bring together uh, formal syntax and corpus data, I think, in an interesting way. So the Old English loss of conjunct clauses interacts with changes in verb placement topicalization. And this is, in my understanding, the first theoretically predicted quantitatively measurable interaction between different syntactic changes. This then supports a grammar model that I try to outline here and that I try to defend where conjunctions can optionally be placed under C, where they behave a lot like complementizers. Because there could be alternative explanation. Um, maybe I want to change this model slightly. Um, what's important for me is that the diachronic effect must always follow. And of course, there are lots and lots of open questions, for instance, about information structure, about the different uh, conjunctions, you know, like end and or, genre differences like prose versus poetry and so on. So maybe uh, you have some questions about this. Uh, maybe we can discuss this a little bit um, in the discussion section. That's all I have to say for now. So thank you very much for your attention.